I'm sure I'm not the only person that's asked that. But uh, no, but um, Desi, thank you so much for coming on. It's a pleasure to speak to you, and I do appreciate that you've made some time out of your day to come on and speak to myself uh, about all things music. But before we get started, though, how are you doing? Yeah, all good. Busy as ever. No complaints. Things are moving along. Um, I'm all good, yeah. How are you keeping? I'm doing good, man. B- busy as ever, but it- it's a good problem to have. Let's put it that way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, could definitely but, be in a worse position. Yeah, yeah. But we're going to talk about all things music. We're going to learn about yourself. You know, obviously, I know that you're you're performing nowadays, but we're going to find out how you got to that situation. So what I like to do is I go back to the very beginning for each guest that comes on. So where were you initially brought up? Um, I'm about an hour south of Belfast. Um, County Down, the nearest sort of big town to where I grew up is called Newry. Um, so we're not far from the border. Right. Um, but uh, the Moor Mountains is the area that people would maybe know. Um, but very, very rural, you know. Um, okay. Definitely, it was out in the sticks where we grew up. Absolutely beautiful area, stunning. You know, a lot of tourism now coming in through it because it's so beautiful. Right. Um, so that's that's where I was born and raised until about ten years ago, and then moved over to the south of England. You made you made the, you made the big move. We'll talk about that. But um, growing up, were you into music from a young age? Ah, oh, your reception's gone there a wee bit. Sorry, you cut out there just a wee bit there, Ian. Oh, I was going to say, um, so from a young age, were you into music? Yeah, definitely. Um, a very musical family. We're all into music. Um, you know, like stealing your, your big brother's CDs and that. Yep. And uh, and then getting blamed for scratching them. Of you course. Know. <laughs> it wasn't them that scratched them, it was always you. Yeah. Um, and so I, from a very young age, I think there was, my ma told me a story where whenever I was just a toddler, she said all I ever did was cry and cry and moan and whine. <laughs> Nothing's changed. <laughs> and she used to leave me at home um, with my auntie, my auntie Bruna, and they said that the only thing that would get me to shut up was putting me in front of the TV when Daniel O'Donnell was singing. Right. <laughs> I don't know if you know who Daniel O'Donnell is, but yeah, it's not a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that that's what forced you in a different direction. Let try and find a positive in it. Maybe I just saw it and I just was instantly confused. Why do people yeah. like this? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's maybe still a thought to this day. Yeah, you know, apparently he makes a good cup of tea, but you know. So um, yeah, so you're obviously getting them. Um, Influences when you're younger from older siblings, uh, your mum, auntie, whoever it was. Do you was there an age that you discovered your own musical taste, and and if so, who were some of the bands that you discovered for yourself? Um, that would have been primary seven. I remember it pretty clearly. Um, what age is that? Ten or eleven? Yeah, around that. I think that. Um, I think. I think the big thing was whenever my mum decided to get Sky TV right. and allowed us access to all the music channels. Right. So you were able to go down through and see, like, you know, all the different types of music. And I just was straight away into all the rock music, you know, like, um, I think the first CD I ever bought was Limp Biscuit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, it's funny, see, the the amount of people that I've had on before, a lot of them have said, because I was about to ask you, do you remember what the first album was that you bought with your own money? And there's a lot of people have said either Limp Bizkit or Linkin Park. The the, the first CD I I bought myself was in a bicycle repair shop. Um, (laughs) And he just had this wee shelf. Um, his name was Jim Quinn and he used to fix everyone's bikes but for some reason he'd like a shelf of CDs you know yeah. 
I bought that the single of I think it was my generation was the single. But then I think closer to that or around that time I managed to scrape like six or seven pounds together and bought Slipknot self titled titled album off my mate in school, his big brother. He bought it and then I just yeah. So I literally bought it second hand. It was all falling apart and everything. Um, so the first album I ever bought was, was was Slipknot. So you're probably talking around, that's probably around 99, 2000? Yeah, 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 around that and time. Give us a wee laugh then, if you're brave enough, what was the first concert you ever attended by yourself or, or you know, with friends or that? First concert? What, like, because I went to a load of gigs when I was young, you know. Uh, not not pub gigs, like a, like a, like a, like established a musical band. Uh, I think it was, it was either Red Hot Chili Peppers right. and Foo Fighters and Queens of Stone Age at Slain. All right, okay. Or it was Slipknot and the Odyssey. And my big brother, John, he's the, I'm the youngest of four boys, and the big brother, John, he was always tasked with taking me to these gigs. He, 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 was in, he, he was more of into his techno and all that, but he just would go for the crack anyway. And it's funny going to Slain, we, we'd queued up for ages, and eventually we got to give the tickets in, and he'd lost the tickets right at the gate. <laughs> <laughs> And he just he looked he looked in his pockets and he couldn't find them. And I thought he was joking, of and he course. just saw me looking up at him like you know me about to break down, and he just went up. God love him, and he spent his last few quid and bought two tickets off the touts outside the gates of Slain. Yeah, fair play to him. I probably still owe him for that. Like it wasn't his fault. Well, that was his fault, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> so see when you think back, uh, um, so. You're talking late nineties. What age would you have been? Then, but you like about early teens. So I'm thirty four now. So yeah. So you're almost you're almost ten years younger than me. Um, aye. So so thinking back then, then who who would you have said was your main influences when you were getting into music? Like, at that time, it was really just hard to, I don't know, it, everyone, I was really, really into the heavier music. Yeah. Like, really, really loved Slipknot, really loved Corn. At that point, really loved Limp Bizkit. You know, all the, to me, that all seems like, you know, very cliche, almost like what you'd expect, because they were the biggest bands. I just loved the, the heavier stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I I'm probably the same as same as yourself, albeit I'm, you know, about ten years older. But it was always the, like the rocks. It was heavy metal that got me into to music, and then yeah. obviously, as you get older, you you know you kind of broaden your horizons and you start to appreciate stuff that's not just heavy metal and rock. But I still love it though. It's still there. But yeah. I do love I do love a lot of other stuff as well though. There, there's there's a loyalty to it I think I have still um, I'm still really into it I just don't listen to it as much I listen to it from driving or from working out or whatever and like you know I just I've got a massive massive playlist for the gym of all this really really heavy stuff yeah and um, but really that would be one of the only places I would really listen to it because you know I think now when you're this age you're trying to just keep your head above water and you need to chill out most of the time, so it's a lot of really, really chilled stuff then I listen to during the day or whatever, you know. Um, what's what's that, the heavier stuff that you would listen to? Well, I'm off to see the Cavalera Conspiracy this weekend. Yes, mate. And then I'm off to see Foo Fighters next week, and then I've got my tickets for Sepultura later in the year. And then I'm going to get my tickets next week for Pantera when they come back. That is so funny you brought that up. I have been listening to Soulfly so much. Um, yeah. I'm really into it. Max Cavalera is a gift. Um, yeah. And 
the Cavalier Conspiracy, like they, they just put out that remastered, remixed record of Schizophrenia. I, yeah. I wasn't into that sound, I think. I got into them later. I, got, I like the later uh, Sepultura stuff. But I'm actually getting tickets to go and see Soulfly down in Southampton in, in, in September. And like, I don't really listen to them that much, but as I was saying, that there's like a loyalty to me now that. Because they, I was so into them at one point. It's just so nostalgic. I have to go and buy the ticket, just to yeah. sort of, you know, trying to say thank you, man, because they get just what they've given us. I don't know. Uh, you have to show your gratitude. It is amazing. I mean, all, all these bands, whether you like them or not, you, you've got to give them credit that they're they're still doing it after all these years. Yeah, yeah. But uh, obviously, listening to all those bands. Was the the guitar the first instrument you picked up? Uh, yeah, but I wasn't. Uh, I think I struggled with it a bit. So then I got a bass. Um, I got a bass guitar, and uh, I remember my dad was getting it for me. But they were saying it was, you know, from Santa. It's kind of thing. That that's what how early it was. Um, I just was like, I want the same type of bass as the guy from Slipknot, Paul Gray. Yeah. Um, I've still got it, actually, right here. It's still here. Um, so you're, uh, you're obviously picking up, the, having a, a shot in the guitar, playing the bass guitar. Are you self-taught or were you made to go to lessons or how did you go about that? Uh, I, I was never made to go to lessons. I wanted to go to guitar lessons. like. There was a guitar teacher, uh, Linda Golly, um, at the time. That was her name. I don't know if that's still her name. Um, but she was the guitar teacher in my school at the time, and yeah. and I went to to her, and they were teaching Oasis and stuff. And I remember not enjoying it so much because I wanted to just straight away write my own stuff. Like straight yeah. away, I was trying to write. Um. And she definitely encouraged that, you know. Um, but yeah, I went straight away, did some lessons, and then I sort of once I learned the basics, I just I, I stopped the lessons, and that was me away. Then I just sort of I fell in love with it, got a bit obsessed with it. I did buy a drum kit soon after that as well. And basically, and, a, basically a, a one man band. I know. I was just trying to just dive into it all and see what happened. You know, we lived in the countryside, so we could yeah. have a drum kit and not be pissing anyone off. What about singing? When did you get into singing? Um, I think I was into singing straight away, but I wasn't very good. I remember um, there's recordings of me like when I was in primary school. There's like a, we went to a recording studio. We did this cross community thing where there was a Catholic primary school and a Protestant primary school and they got together and they wrote a song with the local singer-songwriter Tommy Sands and we all re recorded this song together and I've got a wee line in it yeah. and it makes it makes, it makes us laugh every time because I don't know to me I'm just like that's so bad the way it's just just not a good singer but they decided to put me in it the thing with singing as well though is that First of all, when you're younger, you, you've got you've got to find your own sound. Because you most people generally try and copy some you know someone else that they're listening to. You know, it can take a while to to realise what you're capable of and, and to get used to your own voice. And then there's a huge part of its confidence. And, and when when it does eventually come together, you know it is good. But it, it can it's probably the one instrument that can take the longest to actually come together. Yeah, it sounds like you know yourself. Obviously, you sing then. I, I play guitar and sing, yeah. So, because it's an interesting thing to say that it's one of the longer things it takes to come together. Yeah. Because it, it can, it's changing. I think it just constantly is changing your whole life, the way your, your whole tone and everything. Um, I think I needed to go to, I went to a piano teacher just to try and get, I couldn't sing in key, I couldn't sing in tune or anything. And I went to a piano teacher and she literally just did scales with me. 
and the difference was massive within a couple of weeks. You know, um, amazing because <clears throat> excuse me, if you learn to play the guitar when you're fifteen, when you're sixty-five. You know, you might be a better guitarist, but the guitar still sounds the same. When you're singing, though, your your voice will change through time. And I had a, I had a person on quite a few episodes ago. Um, it's, it was an American singer songwriter called Nathan Bell, and I I seen him about seven or eight years ago in Glasgow. Yeah, and then he he, he, came, he was coming back in May there, so I, I'd spoke to him at the start of May. Uh, on the podcast and I was saying to him you know what you're working on now and and he was saying you know he's mid six. I think he's about mid 60s now so last time I seen him maybe they've been maybe mid 50s and he's saying my voice has changed and you can hear the age in his voice and he's not saying it's a bad thing but he's just saying that it has changed but it's one of those things that you can't train your voice to do that it, it just naturally happens with time you know, if you're playing the guitar, it's still going to sound like the guitar 40 years down the line. Mm. But the voice is an interesting one because it will change over time, whether you want it to or not, depending also maybe on the style you're singing. If you're, you know, Max Cavalera, I, I can't imagine your voice is going to still be sounding as fresh as it did when you were 25. Yeah, so there's some people get better at that, like Randy Blythe. You know, from Lamb of God, he's gotten better over time, I think. Pity about the band at this point. Well, there's, say that. There's, um, some people, there's some people, though, and you'll know yourself, there's, there's just some people, yes, you can go to lessons and you can get taught things, but there's some people are just born with a gift that their voice just sounds the way thousands of other people wish they could sound. You know, you see like your big names, like your Steve Tyler, your uh, Rod Stewart, your Brian Adams. You know, they weren't taught to sound like that. They, they've just naturally got a voice like that. And it, it drives other people up the wall because they wish that they could be like that. But you've got to find your own voice, what works for you, and take it from there. I mean, you've got quite an interesting voice. I, I've i had a real roller coaster with my voice. Um where I was playing drums in a band and then I um, was always doing backing vocals and me and the guitarist, we would share the, the songs, the, the lyrics and the, the vocals kind of half and half. Yeah. And then one day I just did this sort of like high-pitched like scream thing that sounded like, you know, like the bands, the heavy bands we would hear on all the music channels, do you know? Um and everyone looked round and was like, "What was that?" And I'm like, "I don't know." And they were like, "And they were like, do that again." And I did it. And then we came up with this song, and it became like our biggest song at the time in our little local scene. And it yeah. was just like the chorus would come, and I would just scream this thing, and that made absolutely no sense. Yeah. Um, so that was an accident. I figured out I could like do that aggressive style of singing very easily. Yep. And then I joined a local metal band who were looking for a vocalist. Um, and just having a microphone on stage and being full of beans was just like... Because I was at ADHD and I just loved the freedom of just having a microphone and being able to try and just project your energy in whatever way possible. Because I just was full of it, you know, and it was a nice way to channel all this energy you had. So we did all right around our area. But I started to run into problems with my voice. I never was trained. And and then I started singing in pubs as well to try and pay the bills on top of all this aggressive singing. And it, I, I ended up having to go and get surgery then. Right, okay. I just I, I overdid it completely and I wasn't listening to my voice. I wasn't less. I was pr probably not looking after myself very much either. Mm -hmm. I think it all came to a head... Um, around when I was at uni and you can imagine what that was like just not looking after myself really um, what was actually what ended up what was wrong I developed uh, uh, nodules on my vocal cords <laughs> yeah. so I had to get them surgically removed um, and after that you know that was a really that was not a good time because I couldn't sing properly I was nowhere near 
where I kind of had been for maybe six years, yeah. and and then it all sort of clicked in place. Um, I think recently it's all sort of clicked back in place. The last two or three years where I'm like feeling really good about where my voice is, but when you see the person that, that the previous podcast that I'd done was with a, a guy called Toby Rand. Okay. Who, he's initially from Australia, but he's out in, in Los Angeles uh, living. He's playing in uh, a couple of different bands. And he he was on someone else's podcast and I was listening to it and they were talking and he developed the same things, had to get the operation done. And, you know, and it, he said he had said it was a worrying time because, you know, once you get it done, you, you can't sing. And, and that was his main source of income and you know it was a worrying time but now that he's all healed up and now that he knows how to look after his, his throat he's singing better now than he done previously it's, it's weird the way it's all ended up now and I don't know it's be, maybe it's because I've tapped into a different kind of network but I, I'm able to do less gigs for better fees now. And I think that having that sort of surgery and my voice going through that has um, given my voice more character in a way, whereas before it was a lot cleaner and now it's just got a bit more character. And I find mm -hmm. that I'm just getting more inquiries and getting nicer gigs and yeah. I'm not having to bust myself out in the pubs five, six nights a week. I'm doing like, two gigs a week, maybe three max, and then the rest I'm just producing music. So it's really nice, actually. So maybe it was, there was a silver lining in it. I, I've lost me range in a, a big way. Like, you know, I used to be able to, you, you'd shout a song at me and I would be able to sing it in the original key, whereas now, like, not a chance. Everything has to be transposed way down or way up. <coughs> so um, you're obviously... Um you, you played in various bands of that when you were kind of getting into the music scene. Um, at the moment, you're obviously known as as a solo artist. Is it just yourself, or do you have a like a, a band band members playing with you? Um, so I, I think maybe how you've come across me was maybe through an album that we released recently. Um, yeah, I think wasn't that on Facebook or Instagram or something? I'm sure it was. On the advert that came up on Instagram, it was. Yeah, so that um, is for an album that we that we put out in, or I put out in the middle of February. And whenever you, that album is a full band, that's a rock album, and every song is full band, full production. And whenever that sort of when I'm doing that sort of sound, I've got you know, a, a handful of guys I've been playing with for years and we've mm -hmm. called them the dead strings. Right, um, okay, yeah. Because I just think it's nice to give it a name in a way, like, because that's the sound. I'm already working on another album of that sound. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, you know, in like 20, 30 years to come, I want, to get it to, I want it to be very clear if there's a dead strings album or a dead strings show, it's going to be like a rock show. You know, it's yeah. going to be full band and that. So, yeah, there's some guys here down in the South Coast in Brighton that I play with. Um, yeah. So, tell us, about, tell, tell us about your songwriting. What is your process for writing a song? Do you have a... I know it's not always the same, but is it a, a sort of standard process for yourself writing a song? How, how would it go about... Uh, usually a riff first, chord, some, some nice progression, riff yep. or progression, and ju then just try and build that. Uh, I'll usually mumble something, something will just come out over it, and then it's yeah. straight on the mobile phone. And then I'll some days I'll come out with like six or seven of those if I'm in the writing place. You, you, yep. I, I, the, I'm doing a lot more production at the minute, but if I'm in like writing mode, you know, you could come out with like five to seven ideas a day. Yeah. And then you just go through them and when you're driving somewhere, you just sit and listen and whatever one keeps jumping out, whatever one you want to go back and keep listening to yourself, then that you kind of start gravitating towards that and you get that one finished. And Are you always, are you always music first, 
lyrics last, or did the lyrics sometimes appear first? Very rarely. Yeah. Right. I've, I've tried to do that. Like, I've got this document in my phone, Google Docs, and it just is called lyrics. And you yeah. know when you're watching a movie or something, and someone will say some cool line, and you're like, oh, that was cool, and you rewind yeah. it back to just to take it in, and you get yeah. it out, and you put it into your documents, and you've got all these cool lines then that you would look at for inspiration. And I, I've been building that up for years, the, the, these, this document with hundreds and hundreds of these cool lines, yeah. and I never use it. Yeah, I mean, I'm probably the same. The amount of lyrics I've got written down, and, and they, they sound cool, Never ever did they turn into a song because yeah. whenever I I'm always um, music first and I'll maybe similar to yourself hum like a maybe a vocal melody idea and then I put lyrics to it. I, n- I never go to it and try and fit the words. Th- those words just seem to sit there, but they need to get out of my head at least onto the the page. Yeah, I'm I'm, ex- I'm exactly the same. It's almost the song takes the lyrics somewhere else. Um, I was doing this song there recently, and you've got I've, you've got all these ideas for lyrics that have been there for that song for like a couple of years, and then you listen to it. You know, you're a couple of years older, and you're like, "That shite, that lyric is useless or whatever." Yeah. So, so I'll sit and go through now and try to change every lyric to try and paint a picture. And I just have finished a song. Um, I'm doing the BBs for it at the moment, you know, just before this. Mm-hmm. And there's one of the lines in Logic when I opened it up and I hit the folder to go down through it. And I had sung the line in that song for that bit 114 times. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a different lyric, you know, and then I'd try that different lyric like 13 times, another 20 times, and then I'd go back to the first one and... And then it ended up, and at the end it was 114 times for this little lyric, and I just thought that was mental. Are, you, are your lyrics quite self-explanatory? As in, if someone was to sit and read them, verse, chorus, verse, you know, verse, verse chorus, would they know what you were talking about, or are they, are they a wee bit more abstract that if you got 10 people to, to read them, they would maybe take 10 different things away from it? They used to be so on the nose, um, whereas, do you know, you, you, obviously you're aware of a band called The, the Deftones. Yes. So one, they're one of my favourite bands, have been for a long time. And I, I sometimes go and I read Chino's lyrics, you know, on Spot, Shopify, Spotify, sorry, where oh, the lyrics come up now. And you're like, no yeah. way, is that what he's actually saying? <laughs> and you thought it was something else. And you yeah. Think, but now when you see the lyrics, he's saying something completely different, but you perceived it as something else, and your mind went somewhere else. Yeah. And he leaves it like open to interpretation, I think he does. And if anybody all over the world, someone is listening to the Deftones, and they're thinking something completely different. <laughs> and I think that's very cool, because it allows the listener to take the, the song where their mind wants to take the song. And I think that's cool. I've been trying to do that recently, where things aren't so obvious and to let someone listen and decide what they think it means a little bit more <laughs> um, that's just where I'm at at the moment you know but then also like Lumineers a folk band yeah, one of my favourite bands as well he, he would say that you know being um, creating any uncertainty as to what the lyrics actually mean is, is bad for the listener but I don't know um so see, having obviously you're in you're in songwriting mode. I think at the moment. So you you, you know over the years you've probably wrote hundreds of songs, song ideas, things like that, and you've also played lots of gigs. See if you had to pick just one of them: writing, writing and recording, or performing. If you could do, do only one, which one would you choose? Oh, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I don't know the answer. Because it, it, there's too many, there's too many variables to that. Like, like, are you writing and recording to the point where, like, are you paying your bills or, like, because you could be writing and recording and then you're completely broke. Um, imagine, imagine money's money's of no um, obstacle here. Right, everything's paid for regardless. 
So just for yourself, you know, Desi, you've, you can either, for the rest of your days, write and record as many songs as you want, or you can play gigs for the rest of your life, but you can't write anything. What one are you going to pick? Write and record. Yeah. Yeah. So it's write, record, and play live, right? I, I think I would be the same as yourself, because as much as, as playing live is great fun, I think it would mess my head if I had all these songs that I couldn't, you know, do something with them. And I think most people, when I've gave them that question, have probably said the same. But in the real, in the real world, it might be different. You know, I've had a few people say it, if they could simply just get paid to write and record, they would happily do it. But that doesn't happen. So you need to obviously get out there and play in order to make some cash. Yeah, there's so many variables to it, you know, you're like, what, where are we performing, you know, like, what music are we performing in this question, and, you know, that sort of thing, and there was a thing, though, recently, like, I've always had this, where when you get a mix back, you finish a song, and then you go through the different revisions with the mix engineer, and eventually you get to the place where you're like, it's done, Yeah, and I'd be pacing around the room, like, ecstatic like you're like you're like you're on drugs or something yeah 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 and it's there's no better feeling in the world than finishing a song and you absolutely love it you yeah. know that that to me is that i'm chasing that all the time and mm -hmm. and then maybe the mix engineer will be like it's fine it's done it's, and i'm like i haven't got that feeling yet though yeah, you yeah. know so you keep pushing yeah. so i know on the 7th of june you released the whiskey room ep yeah. So, first of all, uh, where was that recorded? Uh, the Whiskey Rooms EP was recorded in um, Worthing. So, that's just to the uh, west of Brighton on the south coast. And, was, that, um, was that recorded completely live? Was that just you mic'd up, set up in the studio and hit record? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, you've got, obviously, Folsom... Folsom Prison, sitting on the dock of the bay, and a uh, wild rover. Yeah. So, three ex extremely well-known songs. Why did you pick those three songs? Um, that and whole thing was a bit of an accident in a way. Sometimes things just happen, like and you're like, ah, oh, let's release this. Um, so when I I, I make a lot of my income from going out and playing live at private events you know yeah. people will see me online and they'll they'll inquire about me coming and doing a private gig for them yep and that's like a really good network that we have in England and it's probably all over the world I'm not aware but I know it's here and it's good and to keep your inquiries coming you have to be keeping your promo up to a good standard so we went into that room that day with the, th the idea that we were going to record like 12 songs just live. Yeah. And John Moy, the guy that shot the video, was really, really, he's an absolute genius, I think, is, is, is the way he can see things. Yep. So he came in and he shot the 12 videos. I recorded the audio. And say out of those 12, there's three of them, which are Wild Rover, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, and false and present so those three songs i'm i'm able to you know i can publicly you know stand beside them on my own platforms and be like i'm you know really proud of these songs um yeah. what were some of the other song choices that you, you know, the other ones you recorded so like um some of the other song choices songs such as like which is a great song but like tracy chapman fast car is one of them yeah. And that sort of song, you know, is going to get you work. You know, mm -hmm. I'm self-funded. Yeah. I'm independent, so I need to be getting these gigs coming through. So you have to have songs like Tracy Chapman, Fast Car, and stuff like that. But I'm not going to post that on my Instagram and, you know, and release that under my own name because I don't think it's me. <laughs> so basically those three songs were from that session. I thought, I thought let's put these out as a little EP and... See how it goes. Um, sounding, sounding great to my ears. Oh, cheers. Thanks very much. But um, we're obviously halfway through 2024, so what is the plans for the rest of the year for yourself? 
Um, I have got another album with the Dead Strings, like that ad that sort of got you onto me. The Flat Circle album. There's another album kind of in that vein. Okay. Um, the bass and the drums is done for that. Um, a lot of the lead guitar is done for that. Whereas, so I've got to do all the vocals now and all my acoustic guitar and all the synth stuff and all that. All that stuff is still to be done, and that takes you know that can take ages because I'll be going back and forward. So I'm going to just sort of start putting out some more of those tracks. I've got one almost ready. I'm going to try and put it out soon. Mm -hmm. I've also got a collection of more of stripped back stuff. Um, I've probably got an EP's worth of that to put out. I'm going to put that out soon as well. So I've got a, an album, an EP, but I don't know if I can put it out all this year. I'm just trying to release as much as possible. But the thing is, you, I'm working all the time, going out, you know, and doing these gigs, these private gigs, and that really gets in the way of being able to sit in the studio and produce because it's, it's it's intense, you know. So it's as we said at the start, it's trying to find the time to do it all. You know, but, you know, you'll, you'll get there. Um, it's just, it takes its time, but it, it will all come out eventually. So there's, there's a lot of music and uh, good things on, on the way. Obviously, if anybody's interested streaming them, downloading them, all that sort of thing, that's on all the normal platforms. Uh, they can check you out on social media for any gig dates and bits and pieces like that as well. Um, but Desi, we've obviously been quite serious up to this point, quite a lot of technical technical music chat for all the musicians out there so we're going to end things with some a few fun questions for you no worries right so imagine you could go back in time you could go anywhere in the world whether it be a small gig in a club or a big huge concert what's the one concert you would love to have attended Um. <sighs> It would be Pantera somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> the, the real one? Not I, no, not this new version. Because I, I, Phil Anselmo, to me, I, I can't get on with Phil Anselmo anymore for obvious reasons. I wasn't aware of that back then, but um, whenever they did like Cowboys from Hell and stuff, the early, early stuff, when he could actually sing, yeah. um, when it was the full lineup with the both the, Oops. you know, with Dimebag and Vinnie Paul. Um, I have to say that they're one of my favourite bands and I did get to see them back really? in I got to see them at the Barrowlands in Glasgow. Really? And I think it was 2000. It was probably not, it was probably not long before the, the, the band kind of disbanded because of 9-11. Uh, the tour was obviously over in Scotland earlier in, in the year. And I have to say, by that point, they weren't great. You know, I think to probably too too much partying, drinking drugs. I took it's totally, If I'd seen them six six years before that, they would have blo blew my mind. But it was it was still a good gig. But they weren't as good as as I was expecting them to be. Unfortunately, but yeah. it's still cool that to to say that you actually got to see them. Yeah, I, I, it's one of the uh, rules in that band, which I think is mental, was that you just had to drink. You couldn't <laughs> have to drink. And and the thing is, Phil's voice was, I think Phil, and I had a similar voice to Phil when I was younger. And if you drank or smoked, like you'd ruin your voice so quickly. See, drinking and smoking before a gig, you're yeah. really, really asking for trouble. And he really did ruin his voice over yeah. the years. Now, if you see the videos of them live now, I feel a bit bad for him. Like he's really struggling. I mean, he's probably he's trying his best, and he's probably sounding about as good as, as good as he's going to sound. Yeah. But his voice does sound shot. But then you spend a whole entire decade screaming, smoking, yeah. drinking drugs. I mean, it's it's not going to be probably end well for you. I know, um, but it, like it, I always say, this Pantera. Back in their early days, like when they put out like Cowboys from Hell or Vulgar Display of Power, being able yeah. to see them at that time 
that oh. would have been like outstanding. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. despite all the partying and that, it did look like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what a band! Question for you then. Now, as you know yourself, there has been millions of amazing, great songs recorded across the years by millions of different bands and musical artists. What's the one song that you wish you could have sat at the control desk in the studio to witness it being recorded? Uh, it would be Be Quiet and Drive by Deftones or Bon Iver Holocene. I don't it's very different, but there's two, just two yeah. special tunes. Yeah. And then the very last question for you, Mount Rushmore, who are the four bands <laughs> or musicians for yourself, whether it be songwriting, whether it be performance, whether it just be the overall package, who are the four bands for yourself at the top of your pile as perfection? What now? As in like the... As, okay. Uh, any, but any bands from the past or just now, just who are the four for yourself? I always when, talk about this as like the three, the three kings. Um... One's Ben Howard, the other is Gregory Allen Isaacoff, and then the other is Bon Iver, Justin Vernon, you know. Yeah. So, but there's one more missing. Would Jose Ear get up there? He might. <laughs> what was that? Would Jose Ear might get up there. Mm. Maybe Max. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, see, that I've moved, you know, from away from the metal a lot now, and... I really I'm trying to, to those guys now. I'm Sorry. trying to bring you. Sorry, you cut up there a bit there, Ian. I'm trying to bring you back to the metal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Max, Max should be up there. He just seems like such a nice guy, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm excited to see them now in September. Well, but you know no, what? I, not, I go to get tickets; they'll be sold out. That keeps happening. Or, or, or maybe you'll do what your brother done and just lose the tickets at the door. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky they're all on our mobile phones now, so you know, be very hard. Just, just don't lose your phone. <laughs> Touch wood. But I, I'll let you know how Sunday goes because that'll be. I've been a fan since probably nineteen ninety one, ninety two. And I've never seen Max Cavalera in all this time. I saw Sepultura back in the 90s, but he'd already left by that point. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I think it'll be a good gig. I literally was online the other day looking for a Sepultura Roots t-shirt with the original right. artwork. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was looking for it. I couldn't find the proper one. And then I went into the gym and there was a fellow wearing one. And I was like, that is so weird that that just happened. And now you're bringing it up now. It's just like... It's, it's obviously a, it's a sign that you need to get back to your, to, back to your roots. Back to your roots, yeah. <laughs> hey, Desi, yeah. thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. And uh, I do wish yeah. you all the luck and success in the future with your music. If you're ever up in Glasgow, give me a wee shout. I'll come along, I'll cheer you on. Request some sepultura from the, the audience. No bother. But, uh, I do wish you all the luck and uh, good luck in the future, eh? Cheers, Ian. Take care, man. Cheers. Thanks for getting in touch. Cheers for the chat. Take care. Bye-bye.